Hello, Storyline. Welcome to part three of our series titled Rooted and Built Up. Now, we're going to pray, but just before we do that, I want to give a big special welcome to those of you that are tuning in from either Eugene, Oregon or Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, wherever you are, we're glad you're here, but we have people that meet in those locations, and so I just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you are tuning in. My name is Pastor David Ashrick, and I'm standing in temporarily for Ty Gibson, who's your usual teacher and preacher and presenter. And I've been asked to do a four-part series that I'm really excited about. And uh, we're in part three, and this is titled Rooted and Built Up. So let's have a prayer, and then we're going to get right into this. I think you're going to love it. Father in heaven, please be with us now as we open our hearts to you, and as we open our hearts to your word Father, my prayer is that you would open us, reveal yourself to us, and give us in this presentation, Father, a strong sense of identity, of individuality, and of your love for us personally. Uh, Father, please be with me. Be with all the technical things that are going on here. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so our series again is titled Rooted and Built Up. We're in part three. Today we'll be talking about tree. And let's remind ourselves that the passage that we've been leaning on, well, really two passages, Psalm 1 in the Old Testament and then Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower in the New Testament. We'll look at Matthew 13 in just a little bit. But let's start, as we have so far, by reading Psalm 1. Psalm 1, uh, we'll read the first three verses. And so it says this, Blessed is the man, happy is the man or the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a, you probably know it by now, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit. We'll talk about that the next time we're together in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. All right. So that's Psalm one, the first three verses. And we've been talking about what it would be like for us as followers of God, as Christians to be planted as the psalmist describes here in an optimal location a location where we can flourish, where we can, where we can fruit, where we can grow. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, let's just quickly remind ourselves of where we've come from, and then we'll get into talking about trees. Our first uh, part in the series was soil. And uh, of course, that makes sense. Jesus says a sower went forth to sow, and, and some of the seed fell here, and some of the seed fell here, because the sower was just scattering his seed indiscriminately. And so we asked the question, what would your soil be, right? Because Jesus, remember, said, he that has ears, let him hear. Let him hear with understanding. And so the soil, we said, would be your environment. That is to say, where you're from, where you're planted, and the circumstance and situation and family in which you are planted. And we noted that your environment really consists of, you know, a lot of different things that can fall into two broad categories. Uh, number one, things that you can't control. And we talked about this, your birth, your genetics, your parents, etc. And then number two, things that you can control. Things like attitude, choices, words, friends, etc. So that would be our soil, okay? Then the last time we were together, we talked about the importance of roots. Remember that? We're sort of moving up the tree from the soil to the roots. And so let's just remind ourselves, what is it that roots do? And we said that roots absorb, they anchor, they transport, and they store. And we talked about the importance of a healthy root system, whether in a small plant like the one there or this larger tree, because a healthy root system makes for a healthy tree and ultimately for healthy fruit, which we'll talk about the next time we're together. We reminded ourselves that the Bible refers to Jesus as a root in several places in both the Old and the New Testaments. Now, what's remarkable about this is we talked about grafting, grafting. And that was the idea that you would take what was called a scion and you would place the scion, the tender shoot, into the rootstock. And you can see examples here of the native rootstock that has now had a, a, a plant or a scion that's put in there. And then it grows together in such a way that you can hardly distinguish 
between the two. Absolutely remarkable. Just, I'm reminded when my wife and I were first beginning to date and court, my wife's father is a house painter and they lived in the Napa Valley region of California. And so I was really trying to, you know, win myself into the affections of my future father-in-law, I hoped. And so I went to help him with Violetta uh, paint a house. And the house that we were painting was a lovely little house that was sort of situated in a vineyard. And not only were there vineyards, there was also a large orchard there. And the gentleman who owned the vineyard and the orchards, he said, hey, come here, I wanna show you something. And uh, he took us out back and he showed us this remarkable tree. And, and the, the tree kind of grew up and had this sort of symmetrical pattern to it. Clearly he had trained the branches into this particular shape. And he said, do you see this tree here? It's an apple tree. And uh, we said, oh, it's a beautiful tree. And he said, this tree has 16 different kinds of apples on it. I was like, what? He said, yeah, I've grafted in 16 of the tastiest apples into this one tree. That's all through grafting, right? And so you can see a picture here of what grafting looks like. And so we reminded ourselves that believers are grafted into Jesus. He is our strong and stable root. Now, in our last presentation, I didn't actually quote this passage, but I was reminded of it from John chapter 15, where Jesus himself says expressly, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. That's John chapter 15, verse 1. Now notice verses 4 and 5. Jesus says, Abide in me, stay in me, remain in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And Jesus here is literally describing the grafting process, right? This is something that happens in modern times and it's happened for centuries and millennia. The idea of taking native rootstock and then grafting in a scion that then grows into a beautiful plant. And Jesus says here, if you are grafted into me, I'm the vine, I'm the root, he is our strong and stable root, and he says, you will bear much fruit. And so we're kind of moving up the tree there, aren't we, right? So, or, or moving upward. We go from the soil to the root, and now we're into the tree itself. And I just want, want you to notice this shirt that I've worn today, right? The, the shirt that I've put on my tree. And uh, I don't know if you're looking at this shirt and thinking, oh, that's a really great looking shirt. But let me tell you, this shirt is my favorite shirt. And there are a few reasons for that. And I purposefully chose this shirt today for reasons that will become clear. Um, well, first of all, you'll notice that it has birds on it, but these are not just any ordinary birds. It has peregrine falcons on it. And uh, I'm a keen bird watcher and birder and bird photographer. And my favorite family of birds are, you guessed it, falcons. But you might also notice that the falcons are attached by these kinds of lines. Well, if you could see up close, you would see that these lines are actually climbing ropes. And uh, my other, uh, probably my very favorite hobby of the many things that I enjoy doing recreationally is rock climbing. And so I've got two of the things I absolutely love on this shirt. And then to make it even better, this shirt is made by my very favorite clothing company, Patagonia. And so you might be looking at that shirt thinking, wow, I wish I had one of those. Or you might be looking at it thinking, I would never wear that shirt in public. But either way, what I want to talk to you about today is individuality and identity. And that is what we're going to talk about in the context of tree. So let's start by just noting that scientists tell us that there are some 60,000 different types of trees in the world. And let's just spend a little bit of time here surveying some of the amazing tree species that there are. For example, take a look at this one here. This is a common tree found in North America. It's called a blue spruce. And you can probably guess why they call it a blue spruce. It's actually quite blue looking. Uh, on this slide here, we have, we have two different trees. On my right, your left, there's these beautiful redwood trees. And I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see the incredible redwood forests in Northern California and coastal Northern California. Absolutely incredible to see these beautiful, gigantic trees. And, and the... the, the um, 
uh, trunks can be as large as the studio that I'm in right now. I mean, there are trunks that you can drive a car through, and uh, maybe you've had the opportunity to see these incredible trees. This tree here is what's called a willow. And when I was a young boy, my very favorite tree in the world was a willow. That's because my brother and I had a willow in our backyard, and it was actually much more dense foliage than this. The, the foliage would come right down and would form kind of a little, what, what we imagined was a fort. And we would climb the tree, and we would have our little wars and, and secret meetings inside of the willow. And so I've always loved willow trees. But look at their very different trees. Now this tree here, look at that specimen. This tree is a cedar tree. And uh, the reason I purposely included this tree is that I actually have a guitar in addition to birds and climbing. One of the things that I also really enjoy is playing the guitar. And one of my very favorite guitars of the many guitars that I own <laughs> is made of cedar. The back and the side of the guitar is made of cedar and the, or excuse me, that's not true. The top of the guitar is made of cedar and the back and the sides are made of, the, in fact, notice this, I just noticed this, right at the top of that cedar tree is what? A bird. Well, like a, probably some kind of a raptor sitting there, it'd be fascinating to know. So uh, the, the top of the tree, uh, the top of the guitar rather, is made of cedar, and the back and the sides are made of this tree here. Now, I don't know if you know what this tree is, but if you're viewing from Hawaii, you do probably know what that tree is. That's a koa tree. And koa trees are a kind of acacia tree that are native to Hawaii. And uh, the figures and the patterns in koa are absolutely amazing. And uh, so the guitar that I'm describing here has a koa back and sides and then a cedar top. Okay, now this tree here is a really fascinating tree. And I included this one because now, first of all, I love the mountains, and so you have this beautiful mountainous setting here. It looks like it's probably Nevada or maybe Colorado. And this tree is called a bristlecone pine. And what makes this kind of funny looking tree, you know, stunted little tree, uh, is that it's, what makes it fascinating is that it's one of the oldest living things that we know of. Bristlecone pine specimens have been found to be 4,000 years old, up to 4,000 years. And so just look at how different each of these trees are. Oh, these are some really cool trees. These trees are found, I, I told you the last time we were together about a trip that I took to that big beautiful island off the southern coast of Australia called Tasmania. And these trees here are what are called hewn pine trees and they are native to Tasmania, the only place they're found. And there used to be vast forests of these hewn pine trees. Unfortunately, many of them are no longer uh, in existence. And the reason for that is the hewn pine tree is a remarkable tree. It is the densest, heaviest pine, but it also takes a very, very, very long time for it to grow to maturity. In fact, uh, by some estimates, it takes 2,000 years for a hewn pine tree to reach maturity. And so when the early settlers were going there and just chopping these forests down, they had no idea that it wasn't going to be, you know, 50 years or 100 years before these forests would regenerate. It would literally take, in fact, probably those forests can never be regenerated in the condition that they originally were because it takes a single tree, much less a whole ecosystem, a single tree, 2,000 years to go back to maturity. Absolutely incredible. And so those are the hewn pine trees. This one here on the far uh, left there, your left, my right, is probably, I think, the largest tree in the world, if I'm not mistaken. That's a sequoia tree. Similar looking to the redwoods that we pointed out earlier. The sequoias of California don't get quite as tall as the redwoods, but they're mass. They're absolutely gigantic. They can also get over 200 feet. Now let's talk about some colorful trees. And uh, I presently live in Colorado, and so in places like Colorado and Idaho and Montana, Wyoming, you get these beautiful trees, especially in the fall. Those are aspen trees, right? Look at how different all of these trees are. Some are skinny, some are short, some are straight up. Some are like this tree here, absolutely stunningly beautiful. This is what's called a Japanese maple tree. And when my wife and I and our, our two boys lived in Michigan, we had a beautiful, Jap not quite this beautiful, but a really beautiful Japanese maple tree in our front yard. And the colors are just amazing on this tree. Many people regard it as maybe the most beautiful tree in the world. Well, speaking of beautiful trees, I lived in Australia for almost seven years, and every spring you would get these, and, and that's exactly what they look like, this like bluish purple. They're called a jacaranda tree. 
and this is almost certainly shot somewhere in Australia, and they, they often do this in Australia where they create these avenues of trees and you just drive through, I mean, look at that. Isn't that just look absolutely beautiful, magical? And so that's a jacaranda tree. This is another very beautiful, colorful tree. I think this is from Japan. This is what's called a wisteria tree. And uh, some of these can be gigantic and also very beautiful and purple. Look at this one. You ever seen anything like that before? That's called a rainbow eucalypt. A rainbow eucalypt, absolutely stunning. I'm, notice the different varieties, the different sizes, the different colors, the different shapes. Now you wanna see a really cool tree? Have you ever seen a tree like this before? That tree is not only cool looking, it has a super cool name. The name of that tree is a dragon blood tree. Dragon blood, and these are found in the Middle East. Absolutely amazing. Okay, the last of our trees here, that tree is called a boabab tree. And you get a lot of these boabab trees in Africa and also where we used to live in Australia. In fact, there's a boabab tree in the north of Australia that, that I have seen, it's absolutely incredible, that's so large and the center of it is hollow that they turned it into a jail. It's actually called the jail tree, and it's just one of these, actually quite a bit larger at the trunk than these. And so I think you would agree with me, just in this brief survey, I mean, there's 60,000 species, and we've only looked at probably a dozen or so here. There is no such thing as an average tree. No such thing as an average tree. We've talked about soil, we've talked about roots, we're talking about trees now, our identity, our individuality, our unique personality. And we're gonna have a lot of fun with this. I think you're gonna really enjoy it. So we're gonna switch away from trees here for just a moment. And let me share with you some really cool research that I was uh, made aware of by my good friend, Elise, Elise Harbold. And she, she told me about this fascinating study. Uh, actually, it's, um, it is a study, but it's actually a situation that happened in the U.S. military in the 1940s. Uh, what was happening is, is that the U.S. military was moving away from prop planes. And, and Jim, that's behind the camera here, he's a pilot. You probably know what these planes are. So the U.S. military was moving away from prop planes and going to these early jets. And it took a long time to develop this jet technology. And when these new jet fighters came out, they allowed the U.S. military to have superiority in the air. They were fast, they were agile, they were really quite amazing. But something remarkable was happening and it was deeply troubling to the U.S. military. As these pilots were being trained into these uh, uh, jets, they were noticing that they were crashing quite a little bit. And these were not in wartime context. These were in training flights and routine flights and lots of crashes early on in the uh, uh, introduction of these jet planes in the U.S. military. Well, the brass was absolutely, the upper brass was absolutely mystified by this because the pilots that were crashing were experienced pilots and they were crashing in different situations and circumstances, different weather. I and mean, there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. And so they went over the planes again and again and again and they couldn't find anything wrong with the planes. And so the, the military brass finally just said, well, it must be operator error. The pilots are making mistakes. But actually what ended up happening is remarkable, incredible. A young man who was a Harvard graduate by the name of Gilbert Daniels, he actually came in with a radical hypothesis, okay? Have you heard about this, Jim? Radical hypothesis. And his idea was that in transitioning to the jet plane, because of the constraints of the fuselage and all of the things that made a jet a jet in this early technology, they had to make some compromises on the cockpit. And the reason, the way they did that is they surveyed 4,000 U.S. military pilots and they took a number of measurements, you know, probably 20 or 15 or more measurements. And then they averaged out all of those measurements and then they created a cockpit for the average U.S. military pilot. And so this fellow here, Gilbert Daniels, who was young at the time, I think only 23 years old, when he was brought in by the US military to try and figure out, he was a Harvard graduate, to try and figure out why these planes might be crashing. And he came up with a radical hypothesis. And his hypothesis was this, in making a cockpit that was designed to fit sort of everybody, the average pilot, in fact, it, there's a lot of people it doesn't fit. And so what Gilbert did, what, what Gilbert Daniels did is, he went back and he took many, many measurements. I think it was something like a hundred different measurements of some 3,000 plus pilots. And this is what he discovered. He discovered that the average cockpit didn't fit a significant percentage of pilots, and they actually had to go and make 
small cockpits and medium cockpits and large cockpits and extra large and extra extra large. And of course it was very costly, but it was less costly than crashing planes. At the height of the problems with the planes crashing, one of these planes, on one day, 17 of these planes crashed. And uh, when they changed the cockpit and modified it to fit individuals or individual sizes, uh, what they found was is the crashes almost went away, the routine crashes. Now watch this. This is what Gilbert Daniels wrote in the 1950s in the wake of his discovery about these cockpits. He said, the tendency to think in terms of the average man is a pitfall into which many persons blunder. He continues, it is virtually impossible to find an average person. Oh, we're going to run with that. Not because of any unique traits in this group, but because of the great variability of bodily dimensions, which is a characteristic of all men. Absolutely remarkable. Now, let's continue to talk about this. This tendency to think in terms of average is, has sometimes been called the flaw of averages. Maybe you've heard the, the term the law of averages. Well, Gilbert and, and others have said, no, that's actually the flaw of averages. And a fellow by the name of Todd Rose, who's also a Harvard graduate, has done some research into what is now called the science of individuality. And uh, he wrote his first book, I think was called Square Peg. And he wrote this book in 2016. Look at this. The end of average, unlocking our potential by embracing what makes us different. And uh, just notice right here at the top, it says uh, from Adam Grant, overturns our fundamental assumptions about talent. Okay, and so Todd Rose's basic idea here is that if we strive for individuality, for uniqueness and difference, we're actually going to maximize our potential. And in the book, one of the things that Rose talks about is this is a fascinating little story here about this statue, which I've censored for you so as to not offend your finer sensibilities. So this statue here is a statue that was called Norma. Norma, as in normal. And it was an idea from a physician in the 1940s who was a medical physician. I think he was an OBGYN. Uh, but he also was a sculptor. And he came up with this idea where he had 15,000 different women submit their bodily measurements. I think they were ages 20 to 27, right? So young women. And uh, he had them submit their bodily measurements. He then averaged them all together and created, these were fit women, right? Women that were in good health uh, physically. And he created what, what he regarded as the ideal woman. Yeah, and then he made a sculpture of it. In fact, you can actually see this sculpture in the Cleveland Health Museum. And Norma was featured on Time, on CBS, and in other newspapers. Well, somebody in Cleveland came up with this idea. Hey, let's have a contest. And they had a, an award for this contest. It was called the Norma Lookalike Contest. And this is what they did. They had any women that wanted to enter, and there was prizes to be associated with it. Um, they would take various measurements. I think it was nine measurements of their own body. They would then submit them. And whoever was the closest to Norma, they thought they would have a pool of these people, the ideal woman, and then they were going to unveil the statue. Uh, you could win a prize. Okay, now this is very interesting. Todd Rose in 2016 in the Toronto Star told this story. It's remarkable. He says, before the competition, which again took place in the 1940s, the judges assumed most entrance measurements would be pretty close to the average and that, and that the contest would come down to a question of millimeters. The reality turned out to be nothing of the sort. Less than 40 of the 3,864 contestants were average size on just five of the dimensions and none of the contestants even came close on all of the dimensions. This is absolutely remarkable. And so he concludes, just as Daniel's study, Gilbert Daniels with the US military and the cockpit sizes, just as Daniel's study revealed there was no such thing as an average size pilot, the normal lookalike contest demonstrated that the average size woman did not exist either. And so we can say with confidence, there is no such thing as an average body. But let's take it a step further. Not only is there no such thing as an average body, there's no such thing as an average person. Okay, now this is where things get really super cool. I wanna to talk to you just briefly about the human brain. If you've ever wondered about the size or about how big your brain is, if you hold your two fists together just like that, that's about the size of your brain right there. 
And uh, some people have larger brains and some people have smaller brains, but they've never found a connection between the size of the brain, the volume of the brain, and the intelligence of the person. In fact, it's reported that Albert Einstein, who was of course absolutely brilliant, had quite a small brain relative to the average size brain. Well, the brain is an absolutely remarkable organ, and it's made up of some 100 to 200 billion, yeah, not million, billion with a B, 100 to 200 billion neurons that all connect in these wonderful and diverse and multifarious ways. And the way that we learn the things that we learn, whether it's learning to juggle or, or walk or speak or ride a unicycle or climb a rock or, or um, take a picture of a bird, any skill that we learn that requires bodily movement or thinking is a skill that we learn by our brain trying innumerable pathways, these neuronal pathways, and ruling out the ones that don't work, and then finally arriving on the one that does. And so, if you've ever learned a somewhat complicated skill, like maybe to do a backflip, or to do a dive, or, or to juggle, uh, it took you a while to learn that skill, but after you learn it, then your body can just do it routinely. Right, you've probably heard the old saying, I don't know if it's an old saying, but you've heard the idea that you never forget how to ride a bike. And that's because when you're learning how to ride a bike, your, your brain and your body are doing this incredible dance of trying to figure out the right way to do this, and you fall to the right, and then you fall to the left, and you fall to the right, and you fall to the left, and over time, your brain develops a pathway right through these neurons and tells your body, this is how you ride a bike. And even if you've not ridden a bike for many years or even a decade or more, you can usually, most people can get right back on a bike and ride it as if they were riding it the day before. Okay, because that pathway, that neuronal pathway, is formed in the brain in a really cool way. Well, let me show you an incredibly large number here. That number right there, 10 to the 81st power, we are told by cosmologists and astrophysicists and others, that's the total number of electrons in the universe. Okay, that's a huge number. That's a one with 81 zeros behind it, right? The total number of electrons, physicists and, and uh, cosmologists tell us, that is the density of the universe. But I'm gonna show you another number that is even larger, like incomprehensibly larger, and that's this number here. 10 to the 121st power, that's a one with 121 zeros behind it. Okay, that number is huge. You say, well, what's that number? If 10 to the 81st is the total number of electrons in the universe, what's that number? Well, that number right there is actually the number of potential different neuronal pathways in your brain. Yeah, that's right. Your brain right there, in terms of its essential complexity, is even more complex than the known universe. Absolutely remarkable. The human brain is by far the most complex thing that we know of. Listen to analytical philosopher and author Alvin Plantinga speak to this very issue. He says, human beings have a rich and varied store of beliefs, and our brains contain many billions of neurons, nerve cells, connected in complex and multifarious ways. That means varied ways so that the number of different possible brain states or brain pathways is more than astronomical. Larger than the universe, larger than the cosmos, the number of different brain pathways or brain states that exist in your head. It's absolutely incredible. So University of California at Santa Barbara researchers actually uh, have done some fascinating research on the average brain the average brain. And uh, what they did is they took a number of people and they had them do the same tasks. So they took, I think, 16 or 20 people and they hooked them up to all of these different brain scans and they would have them do the same kinds of tasks, maybe separating things into different colors, doing a dot to dot. And then what they did was they looked at the brain activity from each of those different people. So here's brain number one, there's where the brain fired when that task was done. But brain two, look at, it fired in very different places doing the very same activity. And then brain number three fired here, again, when doing the same activity. Now, if you averaged all that together, you would create the so-called average brain. But in fact, there is no such thing as the average brain. Now, come with me. There's no such thing as the average tree. There's no such thing as the average pilot. No such thing as the average woman, no such thing as the average body, no such thing as the average brain, no such thing as an average person. 
And this is where it really becomes powerful. A focus on average fosters competition, or a focus on individuality fosters what? Creativity, right? Think about it. Nobody wants to be below average, right? Like you don't want to be below average in reading or below average in strength or below average in creativity. And so as soon as we start comparing ourselves with one another, rather than deeply and profoundly appreciating every person's individuality, and we live in a culture where competition is really just a part of the atmosphere that we breathe. But notice what scripture says about this. The apostle Paul, when writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, said it this way, and he doesn't pull any punches here. He says, we do not have the audacity to put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves, compare ourselves with some who brag about themselves. Watch where he goes. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they lack wisdom and behave like fools. Wow. Paul is on to something here that we now know scientifically. To compare yourself with someone else is, now listen, within the context of a competition, say a basketball game or, or uh, uh, some other sport that you're playing, fine, fine. We, uh, we understand that when someone goes out and performs really well, maybe somebody's like a Steph Curry, right, who's an amazing basketball player and he, he's the best shooter we've ever seen. If we compare ourselves in our basketball shooting, even the NBA players, if they compare themselves to Steph Curry, they're going to be below him, right? But we don't believe for a moment that if somebody's good at shooting a basketball or hitting a baseball or climbing a rock, that that makes them better people. So within the parameters of competition, fine. We can have little games that we invent and that we create. Like my wife, for example, if you play her in a board game, she will almost always win. I mean, it's just like, she's like, hey, do you want to play a game? And I'm saying, no, I'm tired of losing. 22 years of losing. Um, you need to let me win every now and then. So the point is this, nothing wrong with, you know, you want to have a competition. You want to see who can jump the furthest, run the fastest, shoot the ball the best, fine. But what we shouldn't do, and this is what Paul is describing here, people that lack wisdom and behave like fools, when they then take those comparisons and they then attribute value right? Or the presence of value or the lack of value relative to other people. Paul says that's foolish thinking and it lacks wisdom. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 13. And I want to show you built right in to the parable of the sower is this idea about individuality, about difference, about diversity built right into the parable. And maybe you missed it. So let's just remind ourselves of this story. We've looked at it um, in the first and the second sessions, and let's just do this briefly. Jesus says, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Now watch this. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. And look at what I've underlined here. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, Jesus here describes that of the seed that fell, some a hundredfold increase, some sixtyfold increase, some thirtyfold increase. Diversity even within the parable. Not everybody was a hundred. Not every one of the seeds yielded a hundred or sixty or fifty or thirty. No, there was differentiation even in the story that Jesus told. Now, with that in mind, I want to do something that's a little unusual, and I don't think I've ever done it before in any sermon I've ever preached, and I've preached thousands of them. I'm going to quote from Dr. Seuss. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Seuss. There's the cat in the hat, and this is just too good not to quote with regards to the context of this presentation on tree. We've talked about the soil and the root, and today we're talking about tree, the individual identity that you possess. And so uh, Dr. Seuss says this, today you are you, and this is truer than true, and no one alive is youer than you. No one alive is youer than you. Let's talk here as we, as we prepare to kind of wrap this section up. Let's talk just briefly about the idea of worth and value. Worth and value. What's something worth? What is the value that I possess 
relative to you or that you possess relative to me. Well, in, in order to stay kind of on our tree theme here, I want to talk to you about bonsai trees. Bonsai trees. I've, I've always been fascinated by bonsai trees. In fact, two years ago, or was it last year? Uh, it was one or two years ago, my wife and I went to Canberra in Australia, which is kind of the Washington, D.C. Uh, of Australia. Uh, and we went there, and there's this absolutely beautiful display that they have there in one of the museums of uh, it's one of the it's one of the I think world's best bonsai tree displays, and we went there, and it was incredible. I mean, there was probably a hundred different bonsai trees there, and I, it was amazing to be there. And I don't know if you know much about bonsai trees, but absolutely meticulous, fastidious care goes into the artists, and that's really what they are. They're not just growers, you know, people with green thumbs. They are artists that fashion these trees. They create these trees. Every detail of these trees is scrutinized. And these trees, the, the pH of the soil and the perfect amount of milliliters and the temperature of the room and the barometric pressure, everything to create these beautiful little miniature trees. And these trees are actually the very same, in many cases, the very same specimens of trees that grow can, could grow extremely large in the right circumstances, but these bonsai trees, they're just, they're fussed over in every detail and, and little bits of bark will be pulled off and they use these tools to, to bend them and create them and turn them into these amazing works of art. For example, look at this tree here. I mean, that's a work of art, absolutely incredible. And these trees, by the way, can sell for huge amounts of money. In fact, look at this tree. This tree here is in, a, I believe, a monastery in Japan. And it is regarded, it's, it's believed to be and said to be 800 years old. 800 years old. That is generation after generation after generation of people have taken care of this tree. I mean, imagine if a wealthy person went in there, a Bill Gates or a Jeff Bezos, and said, hey, I'll buy your tree. Well, this tree's not for sale. Right, that tree's not for sale because if you sold that tree, where would you get another one? Right, if you sold that tree, you couldn't just say, well, I'll go down to, I'll order one on Amazon. That tree took 800 years to get to the position that it is right now. And that's people taking care of it and, and trimming branches and pruning away. I mean, generation after generation after generation. It's absolutely remarkable. Look at this tree. That tree there is a redwood. An actual redwood tree, the very ones that I told you could grow to over 250 feet tall, that's a redwood tree, right? But it's been, it's been placed into a very small container and uh, a very small pot and then just fussed over in every single detail to create this beautiful little specimen. I mean, look at these things. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, one of my favorite things about the, the Canberra... Um, display that we went to there of the bonsai trees was that there were many bonsai trees, but there were some bonsai forests. And this is a bonsai forest. I mean, absolutely amazing to have a full, beautiful looking forest that's about the size of, you know, a couple basketballs. Just incredible. And these things, again, will fetch huge prices. And some of them are priceless. Sorry, not for sale, because they're irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. I mean, even an inexpensive well, I shouldn't say an inexpensive, an inexpensive top level tree, which might be 100 or 200 years old, will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars or even more than a million dollars. Absolutely remarkable. So the value of something is determined by the one who's willing to pay the price, right? If you have a one of a kind thing, and just think about this, we showed all of those trees at the beginning, but even if you have two redwood trees, they're not identical, they're going to be totally different. Right? They, they don't look exactly the same. They're planted in different circumstances, different situations, just like Jesus said, some 60, some 30, some 100. If you have two blue spruce trees, they're not identical. Two koa trees, they're not identical. There's no such thing as an average tree. And there's no such thing as an average person. No such thing as an average brain, an average pilot, an average woman, an average body. So how would we know what the value of something is that's absolutely unique? Well, the answer would be it would determine, it would be determined by the one who's willing to pay that price. And friends, I want to tell you, you are not average. The tree that you are, the plant that you are, the human being that you are is not average. You are unique and you are wonderful and your worth is immeasurable. 
absolutely immeasurable, so immeasurable. You are worth so much. You are of so much value that God loves you and gave his own life for you. Yes, you. And I know that you might be tempted, as we often are, especially in this social media age, to compare yourselves and to look at others and say, I wish I was fill in the blank. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was taller. I wish I was stronger. I wish I was more creative. But friends, you are loved by God uniquely, personally, individually, and infinitely. In fact, you are unique and irreplaceable, and therefore, you are of infinite value to God who paid an infinite price for you. Remember, price is determined, value is determined, worth is determined by the one who's willing to pay the price. You are not average, you are unique and wonderful, and your worth is immeasurable. Just remind ourselves of, of Dr. Seuss here, today you are you, and this is truer than true, and no one alive is youer than you. And I've been accused over the years, <laughs> sometimes falsely, of inventing words, of creating words. And very often when people say, oh, you made that word up, I, I didn't make it up, it's just a word you didn't know. But there have been a few occasions where I've made words up, and this is going to be one of those occasions. Based on everything that we've mentioned here, I'm gonna make up a word and I hope you like it. Here it is. I wanna tell you that you are wonderful. In the eyes of God, you are wonderful because you are one of a kind. There's only one of you, friend. God, God created you and you are you and you are wonderfully you, right? I just got to quote it again because it's too good. Today, you are you and this is truer than true and no one alive, says Dr. Seuss, is youer than you. You are wonderful. Now watch this. Watch what follows, flows out of, follows out of your uniqueness, right? You're not average. You're extraordinary. You're special. There's only one of you. Because you are one of a kind, you are uniquely equipped to contribute to the lives of others and to the world around you in a way that no one else can. You're wonderful. How about this one? Because you are wonderful, you are unique and your path in life and in learning and in growth and even in healing will be unique to you. Don't compare yourselves among, uh, don't compare yourselves with others. As Paul says there, those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise and they behave like fools. No, you're on your own journey. You're on your own journey within your community, within your culture, within your context, with your God and with your Savior, Jesus. How about this one? Because you are irreplaceable, you can love and be loved in a way that no one else ever has been or ever will be. Think about that. Because your love and your affection passes through your unique personality, your individuality, your irreplaceability, you are capable of loving and being loved in a way that no one ever has been or will be. It's absolutely remarkable. You are wonderful. You are irreplaceable. You are not average. You are wonderful. And God loves you infinitely and individually. Let's remind ourselves of what it says in Psalm 1. In fact, I'll put it for you here on the screen. A Christian is like a tree. There's all different kinds of trees as we've looked at here. There's koa trees and redwood trees and sequoia trees and blue spruce trees and hewn pine trees, all different. And even within a given species of tree, those individual specimens are different. A Christian is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit. That's what we're going to talk about in our fourth and final session. Yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. God loves you personally, uniquely, individually, and infinitely. You are not average. You are wonderful. And God paid an infinitely high and costly price for you. Yes, you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what an encouraging message to think about not just the soil, not just the roots, but the tree that grows up. Father, Jesus said some brought forth 30 and some 60 and some 100 fold. Father, we're different. And the temptation, especially in the modern world in which we live, is to compare ourselves, compare our bodies, compare our intelligence, compare our education, compare our finances. But Father, help us to stop doing that, to foster not competition, but creativity. 
and to see that you value each one of us. If you know the numbers of hairs on our head, you must know everything about us. And Father, I want to pray especially for that person that feels like they're always on the losing side, that they, they get the short end of the stick over and over again, or maybe they're going through some depression or some discouragement right now. Father, just help every person that's hearing this to feel that they are unique and they are special and they are wonderful in your sight. Father, when scripture says in John 3, 16 that you loved the world, you didn't love the world as a composite. You loved the world made up of individuals, individuals that were made wonderfully and uniquely in your image. And Father, the prayer of my heart is for that person that's listening in, especially maybe that young person, that they will just have a strong sense of their identity in you and of the fact that their individuality is appreciated and loved by you. Father, grow us into the best versions of ourselves, but may, may we not lose our individuality, the persons that you have made us and created us and crafted us to be. Father, you have placed an infinite value on our lives, and today we receive that. We receive that value, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.